Welcome to the Princeton Flying School podcast with Pete Rafel, Princeton Flying School Instructor Emeritus. In this follow-up episode, Pete continued his conversation with Colin Unsworth, ex-U.S. Air Force Colonel and retired FedEx Captain. Pete and Colin discussed a wide range of aviation topics and shared stories regarding flight training, weather conditions, military operations, flying passengers, flying cargo, flight emergencies, and even a UFO sighting. So without any further introduction, let's join the conversation with Pete Rafel and Colin Unsworth. Hello, everybody. This is Pete Rafel of Princeton Flying School. And uh, we had such a, a good time with Captain Colin Unsworth uh, before that we decided to ask Colin to come back to tell us some more stories of flying cargo and his time in the Air Force flying uh, the heavy cargo hardware. And so, welcome, Colin. Glad to see you again. It's good to be back, Pete. So we we covered so many items the last time we spoke, but. Um, I remember our discussions on weather, and uh, I just want to talk about lightning. Um, I've had some experience with lightning, but I know that you have had some special times with lightning and airplanes, and I, I think our listeners would really like to hear that. Well, if you remember from our last talk, we were talking about thunderstorms and weather and everything else like that, and the fact that you always go around thunderstorms, you avoid them uh, completely. and. Uh, and certainly uh, we'd be going around thunderstorms and you'd see amazing lightning displays. But basically it was, uh, it'd be a stroke of lightning and sometimes if it was relatively close, we'd go, oh wow, that was, that was close. But there was one time, um, actually we were, I was, I was flying with, a, I was a FedEx pilot at that time and we had a young employee of FedEx sitting in the cockpit with us and he had never been in an airplane before. And so uh, we knew that there was, there was this whole line of thunderstorms up ahead that we would be uh, going around and working our way to get to our destination. And we made sure he was all strapped in. And we're going along and yes, there was lightning all over the place, but you know, you don't hear the lightning. Like, you know, you think you hear lightning uh, on the ground and you know, you, you see the lightning and then boom, there's a big thing of thunder, you know, seconds later. But in the airplanes, you know, you don't you don't hear the thunder. Well, you do sometimes hear the thunder. And in fact, we were going along, and all of a sudden, it was stroke of lightning, and a split second later, kaboom! We'd been hit by lightning. And so uh, my first reaction is, is, you know, obviously shock, not the electrical kind of shock, but just the surprise. And I, I turned back to my flight engineer and I made sure I said, uh, how's everything look? Because obviously you want to make sure everything's still working in the airplane. And he's, he's scanning his panel, you know, electrical panel, uh, fuel, everything. And he says, ah, everything's going, everything's fine. And I turned to the young man that was sitting behind us who'd never been in a big airplane. And I looked at his eyes, and they, they looked like the size of saucers. They were wide open. His mouth was half open. He was speechless. He was absolutely very surprised. And uh, we, we joked with him that, like, you know, maybe when we got on the ground, he could, uh, you know, change his pants. <laughs> but um, normally... And, and Pete, I know you've, you've had similar situations. Usually when lightning hits an airplane, it will go in one side of the airplane. It could be a wingtip, it could be the nose, and it travels along the frame of the airplane, and then it will exit at another spot. And many times, it'll just be a little paint flake to show where it came in and where it exited the airplane. And other than that, it is not a serious problem. Um, is it a surprise when you get hit by lightning? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, is it dangerous? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, certainly the turbulence and everything else could be associated with a thunderstorm and lightning. Yes, that that is serious stuff. But the lightning itself, surprisingly, is not. Yeah. Well, the lightning is generated 
usually when there's heavy rain or precipitation, right. you're stripping all those electrons, and that's what does it. So you're you're in bad weather to begin with. So yes. You yeah, you're definitely in that. bad weather to begin with. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Wow. Well, that illuminates everything, it seems yeah, to me. Yeah, it certainly does. <laughs> um, you've had a lot of experience flying in the Pacific and in and out of the many islands and such. Uh, certainly. Um, I've, I've flown the Honolulu, Midway, Wake, Guam route a lot. I'm sure that y you have done that. Any any good stories to tell us about? Well, certainly um, the Oceanic flying, uh, certainly, as you know, over the Pacific, we would do the same thing. I was based in uh, uh, in California by San Francisco, and we would fly out to Honolulu, and then, yes, you're right, uh, it might be up over uh, Midway or Wake Island and on to Guam. Um, probably the hardest part of a lot, a lot of that flying, depending, of course, when you take off, it seemed like... When I was doing those kind of flights, we would take off at midnight. And, you know, you'd be up most of the day. And uh, then you'd take off, and you've got an eight-hour flight. And uh, it's certainly uh, tough on the body staying awake. And, um, you know, you'd, you'd uh, have a drink a lot of coffee. Um, but the interesting thing going out to islands um, is that many times... Uh, in when you fuel plan any kind of flight, you put on the required amount of fuel to get to your destination. There's fuel to go to your alternate. They throw on extra fuel for holding. And that's pretty typical. That, and in fact, that's FAA rules about how much fuel you're required to put on. For islands out in remote destinations, though, there may not be an alternate. And then you put on a little bit of extra fuel. Um, so that you can hold in case, and certainly out in the Pacific, uh, especially the, uh, you get fairly close to the equator, uh, there's always thunderstorms out there. And uh, I suppose there could be a situation where a thunderstorm will be over your field and you might want to uh, hold for a little while uh, until it moves on and then you'd land. Um, but uh, going into uh, many of these fields, uh, it's very interesting uh, for those of you who have, uh, you know, working on your instrument rating, you know about, you're talking with air traffic control and there's all sorts of clearances and uh, that you have to know how to interpret and, and follow. But going out some, some of these places, islands, where you, every hour and 15 minutes you give a position report and uh, when you get close to your destination, they basically say, you know, uh, you're cleared. You're cleared for an approach into the into this island, and and that's all you hear, and it, it's all the navigation is up to you, and uh, there's no radar, and you go into these little islands. And so some of the more interesting islands I've been into is uh, Johnson Island, which is uh, southwest of Honolulu, uh, maybe about two hour flight. Uh, in days gone by, it was the storage location for the U.S. chemical warfare weapons. Um, and that was interesting. We would land there uh, and then walk into the base operations to file our flight plan for the next leg. And there'd be gas masks lining up on the on the wall with a sign that says, if you walk away from this uh, building, other than to your airplane, you are required to have your gas mask, mask uh, with you, which kind of made you think about, oh my goodness, what's on this island? And interestingly enough, uh, women were not allowed on the island. Uh, because of the chemical uh, warfare agents, and uh, I imagine it had to do with, uh, you know, uh, women in pregnancy, and uh, you didn't want to be exposed to some of these chemicals. Uh, other places like uh, Kwajalein was an interesting place to go into. It was five hours from Honolulu. We would fly out there and back in a day, um, and this is where Vandenberg Air Force Base on the West Coast would launch ICBMs for testing, and they would drop the missile straight into the lagoon of Kwajalein. And uh, just makes you think about what our military is capable of. And uh, been interesting places, and they're all, all tropical islands. Mm -hmm. uh, been to Iniwetok, and uh, 
those of you older uh, listeners here will recognize that name where there's a number of hydrogen bombs were set off on that island and mm -hmm. uh, the craters are still visible under the water. Uh, but uh, that kind of flying is interesting in that uh, usually it's, it's very, it's, you're not real busy. Uh, you know, talking to anybody, and uh, it's, it's, I found it very interesting kind of flying. Yeah, you're just making your report every 10 degrees of longitude or something like that. Exactly, yeah. Yep. Um, you also flown to Diego Garcia out in the Indian Ocean? And Diego Garcia. Um, I've never been there. For those of you not familiar with it, uh, it sits about five degrees south of the equator, due south of India. Um, it belongs to the British, and there's a huge uh, Air Force, U.S. Air Force presence there, and Navy. Um, we, uh, you may have heard recently uh, with our news about uh, Iraq and Iran that we sent some B-52s uh, out there. And they didn't mention Diego Garcia specifically, but that's the only place they could go. And there's, they've got about 12,000 feet of runway sitting on this island, and uh, B-52s, are, they, can, they can store them out there if you need them. Um, interesting thing about Diego Garcia is its, its remoteness, and the, the years I went out there was in the 1970s and early 80s, um, and the navigation was very interesting. And I know, Pete, you've experienced this, where uh, your, the, your navigation... Uh, source was your navigator and a sextant. He said, oh my goodness, sextant? You think about, you know, ships having sextants. Well, airplanes had sextants too. Um, there was a little hole about the size of a D-cell battery that went up through the top of the cockpit and a sextant would, had a long tube with a little mirror sitting on the end of this tube and so he would slide the sextant up through this hole and using that mirror could measure the elevation of stars above the horizon, and that's the way uh, you navigated. And uh, it, was, I was, it's, it was interesting to have that experience of flying with navigators and sextants because uh, nowadays everybody has GPS, uh, and it really it is literally everybody has GPS. Your car has GPS. Of course, airplanes have GPS. Um, and, uh, but back then, uh, yeah, we used the stars, and that was, that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm, I think I'm the only licensed celestial navigator within about 500 miles of here right now. So, <laughs> although I haven't taken a shot in a while. So, it was a good time in my uh, aviation career when I had my own little empire in the cockpit because no one else could do what I was doing. It was fun. So, now everybody knows where in the world Diego Garcia, Garcia is. That's great. Um, we talked about some, some emergencies, and, um, but both of us have flown 727s. Do you have any emergencies with a 727? Well, it's interesting. In, in, in retrospect, it wasn't an emergency, and I guess it could have been, but there was a time I went into Newark Airport, and we landed, and we turned off the runway, and we taxied back to the, the ramp, and... Uh, my co-pilot and engineer, we got off the airplane and we got on the bus and it takes you to the operations building. And we knew that we would be leaving in about two and a half hours after that. And I get back to operations, I get this telephone call. And uh, I, I pick up the phone and this, this man says, uh, Captain Unsworth? Uh, yeah. Well, this is a maintenance uh, and uh, you flew, you know, airplane, oh, let's say, you know, 123, and you parked it in spot uh, five, right? And I said, yeah. He says, well, I just want to let you know that there's one of the wheels is missing. I said, what do you mean one of the wheels is missing? He says, you know, I says, you know, I mean the tire? And he says, no, 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 the entire wheel. That's the tire, the wheel, the complete brake housing, everything had slipped off the axle. And thank goodness there was two tires on that uh, that landing gear because we taxied in, landed, taxied in uh, on one tire right there, one wheel. And uh, I said, oh my goodness. So I, I made some phone calls and make sure everybody knows. And 
they I it'd been a short flight from Washington uh, Dulles Airport up to Newark and so the first people I called I called back to Dulles and I told them I said uh, you know we lost a wheel you know you know maybe it's sitting out on some runway well the people out there they look for it and they look for it in Newark and they couldn't find it and of course, this uh, flying FedEx, we fly all at night. So by the time sun came up, they finally <laughs> found that tire sitting between the two runways in Newark. And it, it had popped off, somehow came off on landing. It rolled out between the two runways. It was sitting out in the grass. And uh, in it turned out to be a non-event. But uh, I th always thought that was kind of interesting. Maybe it's a, a good thing for <laughs> Boeing to build airplanes that can land in taxi on just one wheel. <laughs> You uh, you flew a lot of medical evacuation type flights, and uh, um, so what what happened to you in Honolulu? Well, um, you know, medical um, in the certainly with our recent wars in uh, Afghanistan and uh, Iraq, um, and you you may have heard some of these. Uh, they fly C seventeens with. Uh, with medical crews on board, and they did the same thing post uh, Vietnam. Uh, majority of AIRVAC medical flights were flown, by, actually by reserve crew members. Um, and every once in a while, uh, since I was based on the West Coast, we would fly uh, a medical vac evacuation flight from Clark Air Base in the Philippines back to Honolulu. Uh, usually almost entirely military personnel uh, who have been severely injured and needed more extensive medical care in the United States. And so uh, we were flying uh, from Guam to Honolulu early in the morning, and I get a call on the intercom from the medical crew director and said, we are doing CPR right now on one of our patients. We need to get on the ground as soon as possible. Well, certainly out over the ocean, there's really no place you can go. And at this point, we were about 150 miles from Honolulu. And so the only thing we really could do was push the throttles up, go as fast as we can, and get it on the ground in Honolulu. Uh, turbojet airplanes, when they are flying uh, in the United States, there's an airspeed restriction of 250 knots below 10,000 feet. And so, of course, we... Uh, we're talking to air traffic control and we explain what our situation was. And we said, uh, we'll be exceeding that, that limit. And sure enough, we were doing uh, 350 knots on a fat coming downhill, descending into Honolulu, descending through 10,000 feet, 350 knots. And we did that all the way till about 20 miles from the field. And then I'm thinking, you know, I've never done this before. I've never been going this fast at a low altitude. And I said, I better figure, I better have this right because I've got to slow down too. And so it worked out all right. We, we got it slowed down, slow down, put the flaps out, put the gear down, and we came down and we landed. And there was actually a helicopter waiting for us uh, on the ramp. And they took that patient off and they put him in a helicopter and flew him to the, to the hospital. Um, all I knew was that... They, that patient was still alive when we, they took him off the airplane. Wow. But uh, air evac missions, I was very, uh, I enjoyed flying those missions because I really felt that was something that was very necessary and it was a service that was really needed. Mm -hmm. You, um, we were talking about engine is issues and uh, in a conversation you and I were having, and I remember you told me something about delayed ignition. And I, I, I thought I understood what delayed ignition is. Maybe you could explain the instance that happened. And I think it's a good story for the folks who are listening. Yeah, okay, good story. Uh, 1973 uh, was a operation called Nickel Grass. And you can actually look it up on uh, Wikipedia. And it's, it's, in the, it's on the computer there. It was the... Uh, missions to support Israel during the Israeli war in 1973. And so uh, I was a young lieutenant co-pilot on 141, and we had flown to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to pick up uh, 
at that time, we didn't know what it was going to be. But when they parked us way out on a ramp in the remotest corner of this airfield, we had an idea that what they were putting on our airplane was, shall we say, volatile. And it turned out to be volatile. It was 60,000 pounds and how they of explosives, which would be bombs. And it's, they call it net explosive weight. This is not the weight of the bombs and all of the explosive on it is just the explosives that are in the bombs with 60,000 pounds. So uh, as, as according to procedure, they, they had a, a military fire truck out in front of us and all the firemen, at, they, they had their silver suits on um, just to be safe. And they were all standing out in front of the airplane and we, had, we were all loaded up with our, uh, our, our bombs on board and uh, those of you ever seen a picture of a C-141, it's a four-engine airplane. And so we started number one engine, that was fine. We started number two, those are the two on the left-hand side of the airplane. And we started number three. And when you start a jet engine in a transport airplane, uh, you, you hit the starter. And it's, there's a pneumatically uh, high-pressure air spins the, the, the turbine blades. And then you add ignition, and then you add fuel, and supposedly, you know, the ignition and the fuel ignite, and the, the engine spins up, and it's a normal start. Well, what happens when you go to st starting the fuel, and if the igniter in the engine doesn't work, everything else is spinning and working, and you have fuel streaming through the engine, through the combustor, and then out the back of the engine. But it hasn't ignited yet because the, the ignition is, is faulty. And all of a sudden, in this case, we had the ignition came on late. And you've got fuel that's going out to 100 feet behind the airplane, and all of that fuel ignites. Well, we were doing this about 4 o'clock in the morning. It's pitch black out in this remote corner of the airfield. And looking out my window, the entire right side of the airplane out there turns bright orange with all this fuel burning. And I could hear, not on the headset, but just hearing my loadmaster scream, fire. <laughs> it got everybody's attention. And actually, this, the solution to this is just keep turning the engines, the, the starter, that and turn the ignition off, and it will just eventually all burn out, and uh, it's, it becomes a non-event. But it's a very surprising event, especially when you have explosives on the airplane. But what was really funny, I was looking at the front of the airplane, and all these firemen standing out in front of us, all I could see was their back ends as they were running full tilt. <laughs> Away from this airplane. Away from the fire. Away from us. <laughs> I don't think they, if we'd exploded, I don't think they could have gotten very far enough. But it was uh, after we got everything under control and we shut everything down and we realized what had happened. Um, it was kind of funny to think back about that. So the uh, the fire went out, the engine ran normally, but you had to troubleshoot the Yeah, igniter. so basically you shut it down, and then you, you basically, they, they change the igniter box on the engine, and then it starts fine. And change the fireman's underwear. And, and change the fireman's <laughs> underwear, exactly. And then you went to support the Israelis during that war. Um, what was that like? It was interesting. Um, when the United States said we would support Israel... Nobody else, all the other countries in that area, refused to let us fly out of their countries. And this includes France and Germany, uh, England. Um, and the only country that allowed us to do this big airlift was Portugal. And they said we could use the airfield in the Azores. Uh, airfield called Lodges Field, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a U.S. military field. And so all the flights out of, out of uh, Lodges uh, occurred, and what we do is fly down the flight information region boundaries. Since nobody wanted us in their airspace, we flew right on the border between everybody's airspace, and it, which meant right over the Straits of Gibraltar, 
and right down the middle of the Mediterranean in a kind of a zigzag pattern as we followed all these border lines on our chart. Um, interestingly, um, we said, well, what's our alternate? Because you, know, you always need to go have a place in mind where you need to go if the weather gets bad. And they said, well, uh, well, if you really need to go somewhere, Cairo, you can go to Cairo. Of course, Egypt's in <laughs> war with Israel at this time. That would not be a great place to go. But if it's, you know, life or death, you can go to Cairo. You probably would be detained for a while. Um, Greece doesn't want you in Athens area. So we, if you have to, it's got to be a pretty dire problem to go in anywhere. So, you know, so we're, we really had no alternates. And so we're going into Tel Aviv, and uh, we get a transmission from Tel Aviv Approach Control, and then I can remember these words uh, very clearly even now. And they said, Tel Aviv is below minimums in fog. The airport is closed. Now, I was a young co-pilot, and so what, was, what does a young co-pilot do then? He turns to the captain on to his left, and basically, you know, the idea is, okay, what are you going to do now, captain? <laughs> Well, they said, stand by, and we're going. And I was pretty uh, inexperienced that time. So actually, I think back about it, I should have been really worried, but I wasn't because I figured, oh, you know, the guy to my left was much more experienced than I. So they said, uh, we're going to send you to a fighter field up north of uh, Tel Aviv, 40 miles from the Golan Heights, and uh, we're going to, we're going to send an airplane out to you to lead you in. And we're thinking, oh, really? This should be interesting. So I'm sitting in the, my co-pilot seat, and I look out the window, and this is 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, pitch black out there, and I see this little extra light out there, clo kind of close to my wingtip, hmm. little blinking red light. And I realized we had been intercepted by an Israeli F-4. He came out there, found us, uh, and then he said in his broken English on the radio, follow me. And so we followed him. And uh, those days we did have a navigator, took us to this base north of uh, Tel Aviv, and all the navigator would say to us is, oh my goodness, he's looking at a chart, and he says, there's, there's hills all around. And there, we didn't have any approaches, uh, we didn't have any airport diagrams, we had nothing for this base on the airplane. And so uh, this fighter led us straight over the field, and we did a high circling approach coming in, and we landed visually on this, at this air base. And uh, it was interesting. There must have been about 30 other transport airplanes sitting there already. All, everybody had diverted there. And uh, we basically sat there for about eight hours, waited for the fog to come up in Tel Aviv, took off, flew to Tel Aviv, offloaded our cargo, which interestingly was um, weapons and bombs, and what was their destination? That fighter field we had just been to, <laughs> but they had no way of getting the stuff off the airplane. They didn't have the kind of <sighs> forklifts and things like that to get everything off. So uh, we went to Tel Aviv, they offloaded our freight, put it on trucks, sent it back to that field we had just came from. But um, it was uh, long, long days, uh, that particular mission where we went up to that fighter base, we didn't we didn't get back to uh, our base at Lodges for 29 hours later, and uh, it's uh, but it was certainly very interesting. Interesting times. Interesting times. Boy. Yes. Yeah. How about telling us a funny story? Uh, What's a dollar ride? Well, we're talking about multi-crewed airplanes. We have, you know, there's a there's a captain, a co-pilot, uh, two flight engineers. Actually, one was the flight engineer, and the other, uh, they would swap duties, and the other one, man would be a, a scanner because uh, when you uh, when you get started engine, somebody would be standing outside as a safety observer, and a loadmaster who computed where and how much cargo was put on your airplane so that you were safe. And sometimes you'd have a third, a third co-pilot, a second co-pilot, shall we say, a third pilot. And uh, there was 
among all the uh, camaraderie, there was a little bit of uh, making fun of this brand new co-pilot, and he had never been in an overseas flight. So this one particular co-pilot, second lieutenant, the uh, other pilot told him when we were getting ready to leave, because it's going to be a five-hour flight to Honolulu, we have been designated as the air collector. And this, this young lieutenant says, a what? And he says, NOAA, was it the National Oceanic Administra uh, Atmospheric, Atmospheric Administration, Administration, every once in a while will designate a crew to take air samples as you're flying over the ocean. And when we arrive at, in Honolulu, they'll be turned in. Uh, and they, they will take these air samples and they will analyze it for, you know, gases that are up in the upper atmosphere between um, the West Coast and Hawaii. And this young lieutenant says, uh, well, how am I supposed to take these air samples? And they said, it's really easy. You take plastic bags and there's a little gasper. You know, and like just like in a, in a modern airliner, you have a little gasper over your head to 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 give you some fresh air. You fill that plastic bag with air out of the gasper. You take a little wire tie and you tie it off, and you label the altitude and the time and the outside air temperature on this plastic bag, and that's what you'll turn in when we get there. So sure enough, this is long you young lieutenant, and oh, and you're supposed to do this every hour. And so every hour he dutifully fills up a little bag with, with air. And so we land, and by the time we land, he's got his box of all these little bags of air. And we go into uh, operations in the, in the military, uh, the command, it was the command post. And you go in and you check in with them and they, they basically tell you, you know, um, you know, when you're going to be leaving for your next flight and uh, operational stuff. And then this co this young lieutenant has this box of airbags. Well, we're standing at a command post window where there's bars in front of the window. And the airbags won't fit through the gap between the bars. And this co-pilot's trying to give him this airbags, and the, the officer on the other side that's brief, this debriefing us, he knows what's happening. And he says, Lieutenant, I see you've got your air samples with you. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, here, I'll take them. And they don't fit through the bars. And he takes out a pin, and he pops every one of those little airbags, <laughs> and then takes the plastic bags through the bars. <laughs> By now, this young lieutenant realizes... He has been had, and he's been had royally. And, he know, and of course, he turns beet red, and everybody's laughing. <laughs> uh, the joke was on him. Yeah. Gosh. How many times have you ever had the joke played on you? Actually, <laughs> by the time... Uh, I was there. I had heard a few of these stories, and so they would tell me some things, and I would say, uh-uh, sorry, I know that you're trying to pull the wool over my eyes. Um, there, was, there were certainly times when, uh, you, you know, you'd be cruising along, and it, you, you'd play question and answer with people and see how much you know about the airplane. Um, you know, some of some of the questions it, it, they were got kind of fun. Was like, you know, how many windows in the airplane? Testing to see how how well you've done your your studying, and uh, what it didn't count was the little inspection windows <laughs> that were all over the airplane. And you think you would count up, you know, one, two, three, four. I think there's I think there's eight windows. And no, it was more like twenty five of them actually. But uh, in terms of actually having my the wool pulled over my eyes, I think I avoided that. Yeah. The, one, the trick we used to play on, on young co-pilots is this, the first time they got a chance to actually can fly the airplane straight and level. We had about 10 crew members in the back. They would all silently go to the rear of the airplane and then run at full tilt all the way up to the front. <laughs> and the trim wheel, of course, was you know, he's trying to get the nose to trim up. And he's just as he's gotten to that point, 
down they go back aft again, back to the tail, and now he's got to take out all that trim. Meanwhile, he's just too busy to hear the thundering herd back there. And finally, the second or third time, he looks over his shoulder, and there, you know, the ordnance man is running to the back of the airplane, and they're all laughing like hell, you know. Because he's and, trying like heck to stay straight and level, and right, right. the airplane wants to go up and wants to go down. A lot of fun. <laughs> A lot of fun. We've had another very interesting time with you. A lot of fun, good stories. You're a great teller of those stories. And well, thank uh, you, Pete. It's been a joy to, to share my experiences and to uh, let people know that uh, the aviation world is a fascinating world to be in, and uh, it's uh, well worth all the effort to, uh, to experience it. So we, we're very happy that you've shared your time of flying in the Air Force and your time at FedEx. And uh, we'll find another reason to bring you back, I'm sure. Thank that you very much. And all of you out there listening to us, thank you so much for once again spending some time with us. And uh, I hope you enjoyed hearing uh, Colin Unsworth tell his stories as much as I have uh, prompted him for the answers. So thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Princeton Flying School podcast with Pete Rafel. Our podcasts are recorded at the Princeton Airport and are produced by HG Media. If you enjoyed our show, please share it with your friends. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcasts.